Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate your presence. We have visitors. We're always glad to have our visitors to come and be with us. We're glad you're here. Of course, we appreciate our own members. You out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up, we can be an inspiration to you here in the auditorium as well as you in the radio listening audience. Now, you do something good, shut in a fever. You get on your phone out there and call a shut in friend and have them to tune in to WNGC. The Big John Station, Athens, Georgia, 95.5 on the FM dial, and get this hour coming up. You'll enjoy the singing, and we'll preach to you what thus says the Lord God. So in that way, you'll be doing them a favor, you do us a favor as well, so I trust you do exactly that. And if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Genesis chapter 37. Now remember that this message and the music will be on cassette tape. And this will be tape number 221. I'll be glad to send you a list of our cassette tape if you write and request it. We have more than 200 listed, and we'll be glad to send you the list. And these tape are $3 each. And the money is used to help defray our radio expense. We're in need of hearing from you, the radio listener, and I hope that you'll write to me and pray for me. We want to get out the gospel during these days. And we work this together in getting out the gospel. God gave the word and great is the company of those that publish it. So write in and get a list of our tape. If you like this particular tape today, it'd be tape number 221. You can uh, call for it by number or by title. I'm going to speak today on the man who was in great trouble because of the coat that he wore. The man who was in great trouble because of the coat he wore. Twice he got into trouble because of his coat. And so we want to preach about that man today. I hope you follow me in the scriptures. I'm giving you time to turn to Hebrews 11, or rather uh, Genesis 37. I'm sorry, Genesis 37. A man wrote in the other day from Gainesville and said, Preach Edwards, I wonder if you'd answer a question for me. Number one, does God call women to preach? The answer is no, not to pastor or go into full-time evangelism. God doesn't call them for that in particular, but there's a work they can do, and God uses women in various fields, as teaching and missionaries and so forth, but they're not called as pastors or full-time evangelists. God never calls a woman to leave her husband and children and go out in full-time evangelistic work. Anytime you see a woman doing that, you can say it's not of God. God doesn't do that kind of business. Her responsibilities at home with a husband and children. Question number two, he said, Preach Edwards, should women wear men's clothes? My answer to that is a woman ought to wear women's clothes and men should wear men's clothes and that takes care of that. Now you turn to Genesis chapter 37. I was reading the other day, I believe in the Reader's Digest, about a couple went in to buy a new automobile. They saw an automobile there, only had a thousand miles on it beautiful sports car and the salesman said a little old lady owned this car she wore tennis shoes and they said you mean it just had a thousand miles on it that's right just a thousand miles they said you can call her and she'll confirm that so they called her she said yes I'm 62 years old I do wear tennis shoes so I've only driven the car a thousand miles I had it in a stock car race five times said uh, I came in uh, uh, second place twice I came in third place twice I would have come in in first place the last time but I blew the motor they said well we thank you for the information now uh, Genesis chapter 37 and verse uh, 1 I want to read verses 1 through 4 and Jacob dwelled in the land where his father was estranged in the land of Canaan and these, the generation of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the son of Bilhar and with the sons of Zephyr 
his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peacefully unto him. Now here's a young man had a coat of many colors made especially for him. His brothers became envious and they hated him and couldn't speak kindly toward him. Now I want you to notice another verse in Genesis, or rather verses 23 and 24 in the same chapter. Chapter 37, verses 23 and 24, we find these words. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren, they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. Now I want you to notice verses 31 and 33. Uh, in this same chapter, verses 31 and through 33. And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of his many colors and they that brought it to their fathers and said, This have we found, know not whether it be thy son's coat or not. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. And evil beasts have devoured him. Joseph is without doubt written in pieces. Now turn to chapter 39 of Genesis. Genesis chapter 39, for a verse or two, we find in chapter 39 and verses 10 through 16 these words. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went in unto the house to do his business. There was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out, got him out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of the house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lift up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled, and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. Now here we find Joseph getting into trouble again because of the coat he left there behind. That was one reason. And this man got into trouble, not his own fault by any means, but his coat played a great part in him getting into trouble at least two times. Now I want to speak about him today. Now Joseph was a type of Jesus Christ in many ways. Uh, number one, he was beloved of his father. The him dearly and made him a coat of many colors. And so he was a type of Jesus in, he was beloved of his father, so was the Son of God. Secondly, you have no sin recorded against Joseph in the Bible. There's only two outstanding men in the Bible in which you have no sin recorded against. And that's Joseph and Daniel. Now they were sinners, of course. They were born in sin. But you don't have any sin recorded against them in the word of God. And then number three, he's rejected by his brethren. Now when he came to his brethren in the field there, he was rejected by them. They hated him. They despised him. And they threw him in a pit and stripped him of his coat of many colors. Now when Jesus came unto his own, his own received him not, the Bible tells us. In John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. And so in this sense, he was a type of Jesus. Then again, according to chapter 37, and verse 28, he was sold for silver. There his brethren sold him for several pieces of silver. So was the Lord Jesus Christ sold for 30 pieces of silver. The Bible tells us in the New Testament. And then number five, he suffered greatly in the land of Egypt. Now, the land of Egypt here is a type of the world. And the Son of God came down to this world, and he suffered greatly in the world. You know the story. And if you read Isaiah chapter 53, Psalms chapter 22, and many other scriptures, you will find he suffered tremendously while upon the earth. That is God's beloved Son. 
And then he was considered dead by his father. And Genesis chapter 37 and verse 33. Now when they carried his coat back home after dipping that coat in goat blood, carried that to his father and said, We found this. Is this Joseph's coat? And he said, Sure, that's his coat. And he was greatly grieved because he thought a wild animal animal had killed his son Joseph and it brought gray hairs to his head and caused the old man to grieve very much because of the loss of that son. He considered him to be dead. And so in the mind of God, Jesus Christ was crucified, slain before the foundation of the world in the mind of God. And then we find later that Joseph was received by his brethren in the land of Egypt when they came down to buy corn. Now there's coming a time at the end of the tribulation period when the Israelites will receive Jesus Christ when he comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They are now living in spiritual darkness. They have a veil over their face, spiritually speaking, but they will receive him at that particular time. And then after that, Joseph was made ruler in the land of Egypt. So after his brethren receives him at the end of the tribulation period, the Son of God will be Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and he will rule over God's earthly people, the Israelites, and we will be with him as the church reigning with him. So he was a type of Christ. Joseph, a beautiful figure, a beautiful person in the Bible, very beautiful, and we thank God for his life. Secondly, notice some of his acts down in Egypt. He was a great man of faith. In Genesis chapter 39, verses 9 and 10, notice his chastity. Here, when he was tempted by uh, Potiphar's wife, he refused to yield to that temptation, and God gave him grace. And by faith, he moved on for God and kept himself clean and pure. And notice he had great patience under affliction. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 105, verses 17 through 19, speaking about Joseph, he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron until the time that his word tried him. So this man, Joseph, down in Egypt, suffered tremendously, spending years in prison. There was his feet in stocks and bound in prison. And he suffered that affliction. So did Jesus while he was on the earth, of course. Notice, if you please, his wisdom and his prudence in chapter 39, verse 22. It says, The keep of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was a doer of it. Now Joseph was so close to God, so full of the Spirit of God, such a great man of God, until the keeper of the prison said, I'm going to trust everything in this prison into his hands. I can trust him, I can believe him, he's honest, he's a believer in God, and he can help me out. He turned everything over to Joseph. And so he was wise and there was prudence there in the land of Egypt. Now he gathered corn during the time of famine. God revealed to him that was coming a seven-year famine in the land of Egypt. Now God said before that famine comes, there will be seven years of plenty. And God gave Joseph wisdom to lay up corn for seven years and then they had corn to live on, food to sustain them for seven years famine. God gave him wisdom to do that. See, if you serve God and live for God and do that which is right, there's many things God revealed to you and gave you wisdom to do for your own good and own benefit as you sojourn for God. Notice his fear of God. In Genesis chapter 42 and verse 18, Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. Here stood Joseph in the land of Egypt, facing his brethren that had come down from Canaan to get corn, and they were talking about bringing down Benjamin. He said, Bring down your younger brother, you won't get any more corn. And they were easy about that, and he said, I fear God. Now the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. If you want knowledge, you want to know how to serve God. Then fear the Lord, the Bible tells us in the Scriptures. Now notice his great compassion. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 42 and verse 24, he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again. Now Joseph here was a humble man. He was very tender-hearted. He was a good man, a clean man, a man that lived for God 
And the Bible records him weeping seven times. Seven times in the book of Genesis, you find that Joseph wept. You find that Jesus wept three times. He probably wept more times than three, but it's only recorded three times in the Word of God. Now, Jesus wept three times he wept when he wept over Jerusalem. He wept at the grave of Lazarus, and he wept in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Joseph uh, wept seven times, which is a number of perfection. Joseph was a great and powerful man. And all over the world today, you have hospitals and churches named after Joseph. Joseph was a mighty man. I'm looking forward to seeing Joseph someday and to shake his hand and talk with him on the other side. What a great man of God was Joseph. He, he yielded to God. He lived for God and overcame evil with good. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 10, And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, thy children's children, and thy flock, and thy herd, all that thou hast. Now they mistreated Joseph. His brethren hated him, and they abused him. They never spoke a kind word to him. They sold him as a slave down into Egypt. He went and spent many years down there heartbroken, away from his dad, away from his family, down in the land of Egypt. And yet when time came for his brethren to leave Canaan and try to find some food, and they heard there was food in Egypt, Joseph had stored up food, they came down to get corn. Now he recognized them, but they didn't recognize him. And he used an interpreter. Of course, he could speak the language and knew every word they said, but he used an interpreter. He did not reveal himself until a little later on after they came another time or so. Anyway, uh, they could, uh, he could understand them, and he would listen to them talk, and then he would turn aside and go into the closet and weep and wash his face and come out again and talk with his brethren. A very, very tender-hearted man. And when time came for him to do good for Eva, he took advantage of that. I want to say to you today, as a child of God, as a Christian, as a sojourner, as one that loves God, that's one of the greatest ways in the world to accomplish something for God. You don't find many Christians today that's willing to do that. Most are Christians today say, well, I'm going to get Eva, and you just wait now. I'll get it back on him. I'll get it back on her. And, and they did me wrong, and I'll, I'll, I'll deal with them later. But, beloved, one of the greatest secrets in being a great Christian and getting things accomplished for God is to do good for evil. That was a great preacher one time. If you want to feel the real depths of his love, do him an injustice. Do him an injustice, do him wrong, mistreat him, and you'd always feel the depths of his love. He'd love you. Jesus Christ would love you through him. And so doing good for evil is one of the great secrets of the sojourn for God in this world as a Christian. You don't find many Christians close enough to God to do it, but God said do it. I reminded many years ago during the early years of the war in Africa, during World War II, whenever we first had to go and fight the Nazis, and they sent many of our young troops over there after they only had about six weeks training here in the States because of the urgency of the hour and they needed the troops. And they sent them over there. And in Africa, they took some extended training to be ready for, uh, to uh, attack Sicily, to invade Sicily, and then uh, over in um, uh, Italy. But anyway, uh, they sent these troops over. And there was a sergeant there that had a wonderful testimony for God. He praised the Lord. He talked about Jesus. He tell us about Christ. And a new chaplain came on the scene, and the sergeant was a drill sergeant. His job was when these troops came in there to take them out and give them extended training. And he had a wonderful, wonderful testimony for the Lord. And the chaplain said to him one day, he said, Sergeant, I see you have a great testimony for the Lord, and I'd like to hear about how you got saved. He said, Chaplain, I'm glad you asked me about that. I must tell you. He said some a few months ago, said a young recruit came in here from the States and said he seemed to be a fanatic for God. He read his Bible every day and every night he'd come under the tent after we'd be marching out in the mud and the rain and he'd read his Bible. He'd get down on his knees and pray. 
and his little bunk was close to mine and it made me angry and I cursed him and I told him that uh, I didn't believe in what he was doing. I did everything I could to make it hard on that young soldier because he irritated me in many ways. And then he said, uh, Chaplain, sir, he said one day after we'd hiked all day in the mud and the rain, we were so exhausted we could hardly put one foot in front of the other. And we came in and went under the tent that night. And I said to myself, surely that foolish boy won't take time out to pray and read his Bible tonight. He must be too tired. Surely he won't. But said, you know what, Chaplain, sir? He said he got his Bible out and he read his Bible. He got out on his knees and started praying. He said, it made me so mad I reached down and picked my old muddy boot up and uh, I threw it at him and hit him in the back and he just went on praying. So I reached and got the other old muddy boot and I let, that, let him have it with that one. He just kept on praying. And I said to myself, you fool, you can pray all night if you want to. I'm going to try to get some sleep. And he said, I went to sleep. He said, Chaplain, sir, the next morning when I woke up, I found my boots washed, dried, shined, and placed under my bunk. He said that young soldier, when he finished his prayer, he picked up those old muddy boots that I'd worn that day and hit him in the back with that night. He went down to the wash house and he washed those boots and he dried them, took time to dry them, and then he polished them and then he shined them. And, sir, he brought them and put them under my bunk. And when I saw that, I couldn't take any more. Sir, I fell down on my knees. And I asked God to save my soul. Because that young soldier had something that I'd never seen any other man. And he said, Chaplain, sir, God save me. And from that day on, I've been serving the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful testimony, doing good for evil? I can remember back during World War II, 41 years ago today on the 16th day of March, I came the closest of my entire time in the army of being killed. We made an attack across the Mortar River and there's a patch of woods beyond the river, an open field. We had to cross the river and across that open field and attack the enemy in the woods and our objective was to take a little town beyond the patch of woods. We didn't know how many Jerry's they were up there in the woods, how many machine guns they had. But our assignment was to cross the river, uh, go across the open land, attack the woods, clear it out, go on and take the village. And we started to cross the river, got across the river. The Germans let us cross over. And then when we got out in the open field, they pinned us down. I lay there in that field, bullets hitting mud, knocking mud in my face, men crying, men dying. That's one time I had a man to die in my arms. Beloved, we finally crossed the field, the ones that got out of there without getting wounded or killed, and finally took the hill. There's about five German machine gun uh, nests in the woods. And finally through the woods and through the night, we took the little village the next day. And that's the closest, as far as I know, I came of getting killed in World War II. I wouldn't give you two cents of my life, but God took care of me. And there was a Jewish man in our army and outfit. And uh, he stayed right close to me every time we'd get ready to go into combat. I noticed he's right around me. I said to him one day, I said, you must like to stand around close to me at times. He said, yes, and I, I know you uh, love the Lord, you say, and you're a preacher. And said, I kind of feel like if, uh, if God uh, spare you, he'll spare me too. And I couldn't shake that Jew off. He stayed right with me, and as far as I know, he made it right on through combat and still alive when the war was over. I didn't mind that. I witnessed to him about the Lord and talked to him about various other things. But doing good for evil is what Joseph did. And at any time, if you would seek out an opportunity, try to find an opportunity to do good for evil, you can do a great deed in your Christian sojourn. God wants you to do so. Now, he had great faith and and when he was down in Egypt, this man, Joseph, had got into trouble because of his coats. One time because of coat of many colors, the other time because of part of his wife. He got into serious trouble and, and suffered much heartache. And there, this man, while down in Egypt, knew he was a stranger in Egypt. You'd do well to know you're a stranger and pilgrim down here. This world is not your home. You're just passing through. Uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 they seek shall they, they seek shall be a stranger. They, they say they shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. God said, 
He knew there were, they would have served the Egyptians for a hundred years. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. He knew God had promised to judge the Egyptians for this. Genesis chapter 15, verse 14. He knew they would come out with great substance. Genesis chapter 15, verse 14. And this was a real strength of Joseph's faith. Now in Genesis chapter 15, verse 24, God will surely visit you and bring you out. Now what are you saying, preach Edwards? This man that lived a lonely life, that suffered much for God, that did what God wanted him to do, knew deep down in his heart that the Israelites must suffer a number of years in the land of Egypt. He knew that. And he knew then they must be led out and carried back to the promised land. And that kept him moving on for God. When you realize that you're a stranger and a pilgrim and a sojourner down here to serve God, that this world is not your home, there's a day coming when God will land you on heaven's shore. You ought to take courage and move on for God. Now he gave a great commandment concerning his bones. We find he said to the people down in the land of Egypt, after his father had been brought down, after his brothers had come down, their families, and after they had passed on, and Joseph knew that eventually they'd leave that country after 400 years, that land rather. I've been in that area many times on my trips to the Holy Land. And he said, uh, one of these days you'll leave this place. He said, that's coming a time whenever you'll leave the land of Egypt. He said, I want you to do something for me. He said, I'm going to die one of these days and I'll be buried here in the land of Egypt. But he said, now I want you to take my bones with you when you leave here. Many, many, many years, hundreds of years later, we find that Moses came in to lead God's people out. And the Bible said they took up the bones of Joseph and carried them back to the promised land and buried him there with his fathers. He wanted to openly renounce all alliance with the Egyptians. He said, get me out of this country. Take my bones away from here when you go. Take me out of the land of Egypt. And then he wanted his tomb among them, not among the Egyptians, but among his own people where his hearts, uh, where his bones were. He wanted them moved out. His heart was among the people at this time. But after his flesh had gone from his bones, he wanted to go back and be buried with his fathers. He wanted to exhibit the in, in belief in the promise of Jehovah. And that's a type of the resurrection. And he thought that he could be a, a person in the land of Canaan. And he wanted his bones there. He thought that uh, as a person in the land of Canaan, he wanted his bones there. And whenever the resurrection come, he referred to his bones rather than his body. This oath was binding on this generation. And they said he wanted this done. We must take this out. We must take his bones out of the land of Egypt. Bones taken from Egypt to Canaan is a type of the resurrected body. Now this man Joseph was concerned about that. He said, leave my flesh here with you. You are here. But one of these days you must go. And when you must leave this land after a number of years, he said, be sure and take up my coffin that contained my bones and carry them back across the river, back through the wilderness, across the Jordan, carry them back in the land of Canaan and bury me there with my people. My, what a great man Joseph was. He loved God. He had great faith in God. He suffered for God. He got into serious trouble because of his coats. He had a coat of many colors. His brethren didn't like it. Now if somebody gets jealous of you, it won't be your fault. You just go on and serve God anyway. If we paid any attention to people getting jealous of us, we wouldn't do anything for God. You can't do that. If God gives you ability, a talent, a know-how, an opportunity, a field of work to serve God, then you serve God because somebody will get jealous of you if you do that which is right. Now his brethren became jealous of him. One of my greatest battles since I've been in Athens, Georgia, all these years, now in my 38th year of daily broadcasting from the classic city of Athens, Georgia, we're now in our 28th year, I believe 29th year of pastoring here at Northside. And, and I work in this area over the past many years, almost more than almost 40 years or longer, in this area. Beloved, one of my greatest battles in the ministry, and I don't know why, I don't know why, have been of other ministers 
being jealous of my little feeble efforts. I've never done anything for God, really. Everything's been accomplished. God has done it. God did it all. He, he deserves the glory. And why sometimes ministers will get jealous of other ministers and stab them in the back and try to hurt them and harm them is beyond me. I'm talking about true men of God. That's been one of the great battles of my ministry over the years. I've had some, some that I've done more for them than any other living man, any other living preacher, turn right around and stab me in the back. Well, I love them anyway in the Lord. It's hard to take sometimes. God will give you grace. And that's exactly what happened to Joseph. Joseph here, his brother uh, hated him, but he loved him anyway. He tried to help him anyway. And when he got a chance to do good to him, then he did. I recommend, recommended a man to a church one time in a town uh, some 50 or 60 miles from here. Recommend him to a good church. He was out of a church. He went there as a pastor, doing well. I went to that town and put up my tent. And he refused to cooperate with me in a tent meeting. Wouldn't even come to the meeting after I recommended him to the church. And then later on in years, he was out of church again. You know what I did? I recommended him to another church over in Greenwood, South Carolina. And he's been pastoring there for a great number of years. I did good for evil. And beloved, if you do good for evil, God will bless you as you sojourn. Now, if that had been the average preacher after he, he treated me like he did about the tent meeting, he said, well, uh, to the devil with him. Let him go. I, w I wouldn't help him anymore. I didn't feel that way about it. When I got a chance to recommend him to another church, I did. The way he treated me is a matter between him and God. I did what God wanted me to do. That's what you should do as you sojourn for God. Joseph was a great man. And Joseph loved God. And Joseph did good for evil. Are you willing to do that as a Christian? I hope you are. This man got into trouble because of his coats. One, the coat of many colors made by his father. The other, the coat he had on when Potiphar's wife tried to get him to come in and commit a sin with her. And left his coat there in the room and it caused him to be thrown into prison. Are you doing good for evil? I trust you are. Let's stand our feet. Our fathers, we come today, we realize that Joseph gives us a good example of doing good for evil. God help us as Christians to be willing to go the second mile. Help us, our fathers, Christians, to be willing to do good for evil. That's what you tell us in the Bible, to do good for evil. Lord, you command us to do that, and then you'll see the results as well toward us when we do that. You said you'd never leave us nor forsake us. And when we went through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with us. Now, God, we thank you for your ever-abiding presence. And help us to do that, which is right. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, Debbie's going to play on the organ here for just a moment. And if you're in this building unsaved, backslidden, out of fellowship with God, and you want to join this church, for any reason you want to come forward, you may come as you please. The invitation is yours. I've given the message God's laid on my heart. You obey God. You do what God tells you to do. If you're unsaved, you'd find no better time. People are dying every day. People going out to eternity without God. They, people living out of fellowship with God. People don't have a good Bible-believing church home. If God is speaking, would you obey Him? We're going to give you ample time to respond.